the Sydney Harbour Bridge, it's a million dollar view. Nothing secret about that. But what's new is, you can climb to the top of it legally. These guys have signed up for the climb of their lives, right to the top of the world's largest steel arch bridge. And one of these guys has a secret all of his own. Tourist Grant McDowell has decided to do something that will change his life when he gets to the top. I'm about to propose to my soon-to-be fiance. She's just over there and we're going to go up onto the bridge where I'll do the deed on top of the bridge. It's as wide as a football field and as long as 10 of them. There's nearly 60,000 tons of steel held together by 6 million rivets. 72,000 gallons of paint were used to cover it. Here's a secret even most Aussies don't know. The concrete pylons serve no useful purpose. They're only there to make the bridge look safe so people will drive over it. The bridge was opened in 1932 after eight years of construction. It was estimated to last 100 years. It's 70 years old now. Does that mean it only has 30 years left? Make that 130. The latest estimates give the bridge a life of at least 200 years. Meantime, Grant is building up the courage to pop the question to his girlfriend, Kathy. Sixteen men died while it was being built, but here's an amazing secret. Rigger Vincent Kelly fell 160 feet to the harbor, but he didn't die. His wrench fell just in front of him and broke the water, saving his life. That's what you call the luck of the Irish. Nowadays, the climbers are connected safely to the bridge by mountaineering equipment. Sydney siders call the bridge the coat hanger. And if you melted it down, you could make over one and a half billion regular coat hangers. Crocodile Dundee, Paul Hogan, was once a bridge rigger here. It's been climbed by the U.S. swim team, Chelsea Clinton, Tom Cruise, and one very special group of ladies. The best days I've had up here, I was um, up here with uh, nine Playboy bunnies for a film shoot, a photo shoot, and a film shoot. Now, nine girls. Um, yeah, I was the envy of the, the rest of the guys back down there. Now, these girls had to sign a, a form saying that they wouldn't strip off on top of the bridge. I told them the form wasn't really legal. They didn't listen, but it was a great day. It was hard work. We're up here for hours. Believe me, it's a lot of fun. Grant is still a free man, but time is running out. We are now at the top of Sydney Harbour Bridge, 134 metres or four and a half seconds above the water. Have it a big cheer, guys. <laughs> so I brought you up here for a reason. <laughs> I want to ask you an important question. Will you marry me? <laughs> 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 It'd be a long walk down if she said no. They're not the first to tie the knot up here. Over 200 couples have proposed right here already. <laughs> there is one other Sydney icon that you just can't overlook, and it's right by the Harbour Bridge, the dazzling Sydney Opera House. It is one of the modern wonders of the world and the most visited building in Australia. But it has a history full of secrets and intrigue. The Danish architect Jorn Utzen's first designs couldn't be built. The technology couldn't handle it. Nothing so radically inclined or boldly overhanging had ever been built before and no one was sure that it could be. Utzen went back to the drawing board and came up with a brilliant solution, creating the sails from sections of a sphere. And it worked. Construction was started in 1957, and the projected budget of 3.6 million was funded by a state lottery. But costs blew out, and Utzen quit before the building was completed. And here's a Travel Channel secret. Utzen has never returned to Australia to see the crowning glory upon which his reputation as an architect stands. The final cost? 
nearly 15 times the original budget. And because Aussies are such great gamblers, it was paid off by the lottery just 18 months after the opening. There's one more secret of the Sydney Opera House. The first performance was given by African-American singer Paul Robeson. It happened even before the building was completed. Robeson captivated the workers at the site with his legendary voice. And River, he'll just keep rolling It was long before anyone dreamed of the Sydney Opera House in 1788 that the first fleet arrived in Sydney from England. These were the very first settlers to come to Australia, mainly convicts, petty thieves, poachers, pickpockets, prostitutes and Irish rebels, and of course, their marine guards. They covered 15,000 miles of open sea. This small band were the very beginnings of modern Australia. And here's a secret we can let you in on. Captain Arthur Phillip, commander of the First Fleet, gave Sydney its first tourist tribute. We got into Port Jackson early in the afternoon and had the satisfaction of finding the finest harbor in the world. This ship was built for the movie The Bounty, starring Mel Gibson. But there ain't much chance of a mutiny by the crew of tourists enjoying their lunchtime harbor cruise. This place, where the first fleet put ashore, became known as The Rocks, because, you guessed it, it was rocky. The first thing the British convicts had to do was build their own prison. Every block of sandstone was chipped out by the convicts. Many of them were forgers, skilled with their hands, so the sandstone blocks were superbly chiseled. As if it wasn't tough enough to have to build the jail, they had to build the courthouse as well. Darlinghurst Courthouse, constructed in 1835. Many of them were to get to know the inside of it very well. And underneath? There are 150 yards of tunnels linking the courthouse with the cells. One tunnel led from the courthouse to the gallows in the jail. It was bricked up in 1921. The travel channel has arranged for the door to the gallows to be opened for the first time in over 30 years. Releasing a secret long imprisoned in the dark. 79 prisoners took the one-way walk through this tunnel to be greeted by the hangman's noose. The most notorious was the outlaw preacher Captain Moonlight, a murderer and bank robber. Crazy thing is, he went straight for a while and earned a living giving lectures on the subject, Crime Doesn't Pay. The tunnels are open to the public only once a year. But the underground labyrinth of Sydney has more secrets to reveal. St. James Station, built in 1926. It was part of the city subway system, but some of the tunnels were never used. These long forgotten tunnels stretch for two miles before petering out. But there's a Sydney secret down here. Japanese submarines from the same unit that attacked Pearl Harbor slipped unnoticed into Sydney in 1942 and shelled the city. The people became so scared they thought they were going to be bombed and set this up as an air raid shelter. Submarines, Japanese submarines shelled Sydney's eastern suburbs. The bombers never came, but one tunnel that reaches right towards the edge of the harbor has an even more curious secret to reveal. Now we even believe that General MacArthur had an office down here. This was his bunker where he made plans for the defense of Sydney. But the secret remains. Just how much of the World War II Pacific campaign was planned by General MacArthur right here? <laughs> 